When two supercharged cars are optimized for their respective demands, who comes out on top? That's the question we're gonna to attempt to answer today. Plus, you'll get a first-hand look at our custom tuning process. AMG fans, this is the moment you've been waiting for. It's time! OJ of Fluid Motor Union here, Chicagoland's premier luxury repair and performance shop in Naperville, Illinois, bringing you the second part of a little tussle we started a few weeks back. In the previous video, we covered all the similarities and differences of the VRP and WiseTech M113K Whipple Supercharger kits. Now, we wanted to get into the dyno numbers, but a crankcase vent hose that let loose forced us to slow it down. And that's a good thing, because we wanted to cover a whole bunch of stuff and we would have hate to have cut anything out. Since we ran over all the practical information, the only thing left to do now is to get both these cars strapped down in the dyno and dial in the tunes. Now we already covered the kits in depth in the last video, but we'll gloss over the modifications real quick in case anyone's missed it. In this corner, equipped with the VRP Whipple Blower, we have Alex's E55 Wagon, a 92 millimeter throttle body, headers, factory intercooler, upgraded fuel pumps, upgraded injectors with E85 compatibility, and a custom exhaust, dual 3.5 inch cold air intake built by the one and only FMU. And in this corner, sporting the WiseTech Whipple Supercharger, Miguel's E55 sedan. Modified to fit a 105 millimeter throttle body, Weisstech intercoolers, headers, 180 millimeter crank pulley, 69 millimeter blower pulley, upgraded fuel pumps, upgraded injectors, billet looped fuel rails, and a trunk water mounted ice tank with AEM methanol injection. Clearly, both of these cars have some modifications beyond their standard supercharger kits. So we're expecting to see some solid power numbers from both. But based on your expectations of the mod list alone, let's see if your educated guesses are correct by dropping a comment below. Now reminder, this is on our Heartbreaker Dyno Dynamics. So we're not gonna be able to get true before and after numbers since both of these cars were modified elsewhere long, long ago and already received base tunes with fuel injector scaling so they could run well enough to move around. But we've tuned a lot of E55s over the years and bone stock cars usually put down about 369 wheel horsepower. Remember, our dyno is a loaded dyno, not an inertia-based dyno, so the peak power numbers are going to be lower than what you're used to seeing. To give you an idea, Hellcat's producing 707 horsepower lands somewhere in the 500 wheel horsepower dyno range. But OJ, that's a 29% drivetrain loss. It should only be 15%. Listen here, you little punk. If you think your car only loses 15% of its power spinning through a transmission, whipping around viscous fluid, spinning clutch plates out to a drive shaft, into a gear differential, back out to axles, wheel bearings, brake discs, and 40 pounds plus of wheels and tires, I don't give a damn, and neither does my non-corrected dyno. It produces repeatable numbers, and I see those across similar makes and models. I use my dyno to measure deltas. Because I'm about those gains. <clears throat> not inflate your ego. It doesn't matter what the number reads as long as it's consistent and repeatable. Deal with it. When it comes to custom tuning, it's all about the tuner's information and ability. In order to remove the limiters holding a car back, you've got to know where to find them. Around 2013, we were lucky enough to meet Matt over at HD Tuning. And since the beginning of our partnership well over a decade ago, we have tuned thousands of cars with phenomenal outcomes. Less common than ever are people who are still good at tuning this older stuff. With the shrinking market, finding skilled people who remain familiar with the antiquated ECU architecture is difficult, but Matt's skill with the E55 control unit means he's also good at the similar Bi-Turbo 65 AMGs. That ECU happens to be the same one used in the Wyra. Knowing how to manipulate these controllers is what's given him the opportunity to tune more Paganis than anyone else in the world, 
which means his skills are as sharp as ever. With Alex's car strapped down and ready to go, we need to read the software version so we can send a file to Matt for modification. Now a big problem is with remote tuning, the Bosch ME 2.8's ECU that the file present on the ECU can't be readily read out through OBD2. You need to pull the ECU and bench read it, which is much more complicated for us. And it's much easier to, to start from scratch. Now, where Matt thinks is scratch, now that's based off his experience extracting big custom power doing aftermarket kits. We'll do a quick rundown before the file is switched and take note of a few things like timing and air fuel. Because once we write over it... Are you going to drink all that? No. It's gone for good. In order for a custom dyno tune to really be worth anything above and beyond a canned tune, depends on how we monitor the changes. Data logging allows us to see exactly what's going on in the ECU and the engine. This is vital to the tuning process because the tuner has to be able to see the outcome of the changes he is making in the maps. The main data points that we look at from the factory computer are air fuel ratio, ignition timing, boost, intake air temp, engine RPM, coolant temp, throttle position, and calculated load as well as external data like horsepower and torque that we get from reading the dyno. We also have the ability to monitor air fuel ratios from the tailpipe. We want power, but it has to be safe power. And having a dyno operator with not only experience in tuning, but who also is well versed in the mechanical function and theory of your engine, <coughs> fluid motor union, can be critical to the outcome. But enough talking, let's dyno. All right, we ran the car, we got some logs, and now we have HD Tuning's base file loaded on there. As I said before, the file is constructed with a best guess of how this car should want to react in a safe but conservative way that allows us to start tuning from here. We're gonna go ahead and log it and run it and see what happens. All right, our first run's done, and I'm seeing a few things of concern, but also some good stuff. 483 was our best run previously with gasoline. We're currently at 486. However, the peaks are a little bit different. You can see we peak a little bit earlier at 5750, but then we start to taper off. Now, I'm expecting to see that because on a conservative file, you're gonna have timing pulled in a few areas. However, I am not liking how lean it's getting in this section in the middle here. We're gonna definitely have to work on that. These are the changes we gotta make. We gotta watch for detonation, uh, make sure we're logging and make sure we get out of it. But we get a lot richer, which on E55 motors, I like to be in the high 11s, very low 12s. If we're gonna be making big power, that's where we're heading. We just gotta try to see if we can drop this whole curve down. So I'm gonna send Matt the logs, we're gonna send them the dyno graphs and we're gonna make some changes, get another file on here and keep this process going. Okay, so oftentimes on the dyno we run into issues and today is no exception. We are having a problem right now, not only with the tune, but also mechanically. First of all, take you to the graph here. Now this yellow run you might have seen from the other video, more or less where we were dealing with before. The main issue is this dip that we're seeing here. What this dip is, now these red and black runs are the best ones from the files that we've tried. We are now about to be on our fourth file. It's going lean in this area as the RPMs come up. We've tried to correct for this and we're not seeing a huge change between the runs between the files. So that's got us looking into other areas and us looking into other areas is revealed that the intercooler pump is not flowing, cooling the charge. Now, is that causing our lean issue? Do we just need to add more fuel? We don't know. Uh, we have to correct the issues as we find them. And then we can continue to dyno, continue to run through it and see if the issue is mechanical or further in the tune. But until we know the car is working 100%, 
there's not much we can do. So that stops us for today. We're going to have to pull Alex's car off. We'll probably pull the other car on and continue dynoing on just to keep that going while uh, tech here figures out what's going on mechanically. But we can see that the pump isn't running. We've got to figure out why it's not running. A few moments later. All right, so this thing's making a ton of torque. And as you can see here, we've got a lot of tire slip on the dyno. So we're gonna go ahead and drop the air pressure in the tires a little bit, see if we can get it to hook up better. So while Donnie gets those tire pressures set, let me go over what's happened in the last few weeks since we found the intercooler issue. Now the intercooler was dead when we got in there, but we also did see some problematic hoses that could have been rubbing on the belt, causing a future issue. And we went ahead and took care of that, along with something I've been wanting Alex to get taken care of for a while, which is the looped fuel rail. Now on E55s, they have a dead end system for the fuel system, which means fuel comes in one way and isn't returned. All the pressure regulation is handled inside of the tank via the pump. And because of that, you can have, depending on where that goes, a low side if the fuel injector demand is too high. Now this is kind of a theory that isn't necessarily been confirmed, but many people have theorized that a lot of the failures of E55s on cylinder seven and eight happened due to that end being the last cylinders to get fuel. Now, I've never seen a car have those cylinders fail that had a loop fuel rail, and I've seen stock cars fail with those cylinders fail without a loop fuel rail, the OEM fuel rail. So it's something that I recommend to every single one of my E55 customers looking to chase power. Um, I'm glad he finally got it in there. I feel more confident in, the, in tuning this car now. However, that being said, let's talk about the graph, even though it looks like a jumbled mess right now. And it looks like a jumbled mess because we're seeing these peaks and dips and peaks and dips. Now you might think it's hard to read anything from that, but what I'm seeing is the car is actually trying to make more power and torque through the area that we saw the intercooler dip. So this is a positive sign. And as soon as I get that tire pressure set, I think we're gonna see this thing smooth out and have a more consistent graph. Two weeks, nine files, and 52 dyno runs later, we're starting to make some meaningful progress. Now, I did say we've got 52 runs into this thing, which when people ask what we're doing when we're custom tuning, we're running this car until we have a product. And a lot of times that product isn't done in one or two runs. It could be done as high as 100 runs. Um, the difficulty with the E55 platform and the M113K motor is that they do not like heat and they heat soak very quickly. The first run, after it's been warmed, the oil's been loosened up from dead cold. The first run after that, after you let it cool back down, is always going to be your peak run. And then it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to cool back down to another point where it's going to peak. That in-between time represents a lot of time wasted if you're trying to tune this thing rapidly. So as you can imagine with 52 runs, we're not letting it cool down for a half an hour each time because as long as this thing took, it would take even longer. So what we're doing in that case is we know operating temps where this car is about running. So the goal is keep the car at operating temp and dyno in that area, not necessarily looking for a peak. We'll peak this thing in a minute here and you'll see the difference between the numbers, but here represents just four iterations of a file where we were making power, how we were making power, and we've basically got it dialed in to what we were looking for at the beginning, a air fuel ratio between 12, around 12, a little richer, but I'm happy with this. It's safe. I know it's going to make good power once we get it uh, cooled down and all set, but that being said, I'd say this file's done for now. All right, we're here. And just as predicted, the car made more power, 502, which puts this thing in Hellcat territory. As you can see that cold run, that's what we were dealing with. And the two previous cold runs that you saw us talking about earlier in the video, 
483 being Alex's best run before we started tuning, 486 being the problem issue that we were running into with the AFRs, 478, now keep in mind these were the cold runs, 478 is the, showing you the difference here between hot and cold runs, but what we're actually comparing are these three runs down here. It looks like a pickup of well over 15 horsepower and I'm pretty happy with that. Alex is gonna be happy with that. It's in the ranges that we want it to, all through the middle here. Forgive this graph, it's a little choppy because we were learning how to load this car. Every single car, especially with the 55s because they make so much torque, tend to spin the wheels. So, but as you would see, this would just follow through, ignore those bumps there and continue on this line which follows up here. But I'm really happy with these numbers. But how does it stack up to the other car? Wow, some surprises right out of the gate. Now, we ran the car with the file it came in with, and we ran our base, which is our best guess, to start the tuning process. And already we're seeing quite a difference between the two kits. Now, file here, one, as you see where it came in at, this 576, 76 more horsepower than the best we could squeak out with Alex's setup. 596 was our best guess, and our best guess is quite a bit richer than this other file. Now, this might mean that this setup might like a little bit more fuel than where we typically run the 55s, but this setup is almost completely different. Different in intercooler, different. Intake, different. Throttle body, I mean, there's so many differences between them other than the supercharger itself that it's probably gonna act a little bit differently and require a bit more effort in the tune. Let's make our changes, get them over to Matt and see what we come up with. This, this is crazy. It's another 20 horsepower although not exactly where I want it. Now, we're peaking a little bit higher with the changes that we made. We more or less left the air fuel alone, but the real telling factor is we're still not making this mid-range and we're still richer. So, that being said, I'd like to fatten this mid-range up a little bit, see if we can play with that change timing, but it seems to like this richer air fuel setup rated 11, um, and 11's very, very safe, a little bit conservative, but with this extra power, I've got a few ideas of what could be making the difference between the two kits other than the tune. But that being said, let's try a few more things and see what happens. <laughs> Ran a couple more files, tried a few more experiments, and our power's peaking out. This thing is actually much more consistent than your typical E55 setup. I have a feeling that has to do with the design of the intercooler. Alex has a stock intercooler. Now, while the stock intercooler is very efficient for the stock blower at the stock power level, stock boost level, once you start pushing more power through it, people know that it becomes a restriction uh, both in its cooling capacity and in its airflow. And this is before you even hook it up to a Whipple. So I have a feeling that that's causing a lot of the restriction, why we're seeing a big power loss between these two cars. But you gotta remember, Alex has a smaller throttle body, 93 millimeters versus 104, which I think might be limiting airflow. However, I think the real difference here is gonna be the boost level, which we're seeing higher on the car with the WiseTech blower kit. However, that isn't how the WiseTech kit came. He's running a 180 millimeter lower pulley, which actually allows that blower to spin up a little faster than WiseTech might have intended. So with all these modifications, I think we're seeing a clear difference. So what do I think about all this? Well, 
At the end of the day, and as much as I hate giving this answer, it's apples to oranges. You've got a kit that comes from the producer that allows a lot of customization, a lot of modification in order to suit your wants and needs. Then you have another kit that comes in an all-in-one package that has been heavily modified in order to make bigger power. So when you get down to it, you're probably gonna end up spending about the same for both setups. And in this case, you probably could easily guess who spent more on custom modifications than the other one from the results. Well, the results speak for themselves and we've gone over a ton of information and hopefully you guys have a better understanding of what goes into a custom tune and the differences between similar kits. Now, if you've got any questions yourself about either of these kits, we happen to be wholesalers for both. Or if you're looking for a custom tune for your car, go ahead and reach out to us. But anyways, we appreciate you watching the video and if you could like, subscribe, and make sure you tune in next week. Thanks again.